Hey everybody, welcome to the Bad Reading Podcast. Uh, we're going to try and make Fetch happen this week. Uh, <laughs> I'm your host, Atlas Novak. Who else is with me today? Hi, I'm your other host, Chris Hetlinger. They're back. I'm back. I still have a kidney infection, but I'm still back. But, but I missed you, like a lot. <laughs> uh, and then from the Two on Who podcast and our very own At- Avatar The Last Airbender episode, Kat Moore is with us today. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me back. Yeah. Uh, I, for for the, uh, the non-YouTube people, you got cat trees and a cat wheel in the background there. I got a cat. The cat's not in the background, but I have a cat tree, and then this is a cat wheel. Uh, Imagine a hamster wheel, and he runs on it really fast. Like, imagine a cheetah, but in a circle. They do that. The only thing is that he mostly does it for attention, (laughs) because I'm so excited. It's expensive. And so I was so excited when he would use it in the beginning. I'd be like, yay! And now he runs for five seconds, and he pauses, and he's like... Well, where is my where is my elation? Like that's amazing. Crazy. So why aren't you mentioning it? Like positive reinforcement, um, as far as attention goes, actually works really really well for cats. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that way into I have I have a pet training business. So if you want to train your cats tricks or your dogs like regular behaviors or tricks, I can do you that. Can teach a cat tricks though. Like, you can. You, what tricks have you taught a cat? Okay, so um, oh. our newest kitten, Quasar, um, is was supposed to be my cat. Is now definitely my dad's cat. Um, mm-hmm. She knows how to jump through a hoop. Um, but the best thing that she does is my dad, since he only has one functioning ear, he doesn't have hearing depth perception. Um, so when the phone rings, she goes and finds it for him. Um, so he doesn't have to go looking for his phone when he leaves it somewhere. Um, so she'll go and she'll go like look at the phone and like tap at it and stuff like around it not like to answer the phone um but she'll show him where it is so he can pick it up yeah so you can train your cats lots of different things um you trains me so well <laughs> i know my mom my mom trained uh sophie her cat how to uh how to stand on her hind legs for a bit mm-hmm. um it's mostly to beg for food she's like i'm not giving you this until you like do the thing and then um, but I don't think that's like the thing you can go, all right, stand for me or sit. You can, you can. I call that no. one the mere cat. Yeah. So, but like, it, it's not something she does on verbal command. It's just, I have food. Do this for me. You can train it verbal command. Yeah. You just have to have a clicker and yeah. patience. I don't get a clicker. I got my fingers right here. I didn't pay any money for yeah, that. You it's can all use your fingers. <laughs> I cannot click loud enough like this is not loud enough for me to like get the attention of the animals that i am training reliably so i have an actual clicker at several of professional you know <laughs> make it seem like you're worth you are worth the money but you have to <laughs> have some things to show them see now i i couldn't snap my fingers whistle or blow a bubble for like a long time you can't blow a bubble or whistle blowing out oh you have to like do it going in yeah i know what yeah. yeah. Um. The, the well, the reason is because when I was little, my two front teeth got knocked out, and they didn't grow back for five years. <gasps> oh, oh no. no! I didn't even know that about you. Yeah. So uh, when I was two yeah. years old, the dog. Yeah, the dog hip checked me into a desk and knocked both teeth out. Um. And then the, <laughs> and then they <laughs> didn't grow back till I was seven. So like, even like it took a long time to unlearn biting with the side of my mouth. Um. <laughs> yeah so yeah. took a long time to learn how to whistle the snapping and fingers thing i think just gets easier as you get older and your hands get stronger but... i don't know about that i still do the the weird like i snap with my ring finger not mm-hmm. my i cannot snap with any other like yeah it's, it's just not it's not happening um, i snap and i hurt i hurt my i'm not gonna show you guys it's gross but i hurt my pinky the other day because i was out, i was outside walking the cat because i'm i'm that lady yeah, um, it's a good thing to do. Yeah, and but then I was like, I was like, I should keep some documentation to see his journey, and so I was filming him. But then he ran, and I'm not oh, used no. to filming, and I fell down on the stairs. So that's what the video ends with. Wait, let, I I, I, I kind of got to see that just so like I'm ima- imagining like the comical, not just falling, but like the bounce that you see in cartoons. Boom, 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 boom. <laughs> down oh no, just. Right there, just oh, yeah, oh. down. 
Um, so uh, today on Bad Reading, like we do every week, we like to ask our guests, uh, Kat, what are you into? Um, I am really into rom-coms, high school mu- high school movies, and musicals. Even a high school musical. I love them. I think that rom-coms are needed and that fun movies are important. And so that's what I'm into. Yeah, because like, you gave me a very large list of uh, <laughs> stuff, which is always good. I always appreciate that. Um, and two of the ones you uh, picked were Heathers and Mean Girls. Uh which are the movies of our, our of the millennial generation? Like that's our Breakfast Club. Both of those movies. I didn't like Breakfast Club. I loved Heather's and Mean Girls, but Heather's is a direct response to Breakfast Club. It that was dark sense. comedy, being like, yeah. "Oh, really? We're all the diff. We're all have inner lives deep down." I don't suck like now. <laughs> and I love that. Now, originally, what I wanted to do was I found a story that's a crossover between those two movies, and it's in the form of, like, a group chat, uh, but it wasn't long enough. Um, uh, normally, I wouldn't talk tease the listener. You fanfic tease. What? You fanfic tease. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I wouldn't uh, fic, fic tease the listener like that, but it's one of those things where I think you kind of got to see it. Um it's, I'll put it in the show notes, but the, the story I found is also pretty freaking funny. Um, this is in Mean Girls. We have uh, on fanfiction.net here, it's called Diamonds and Rust, and it's by someone named uh, New Kanoichi. Net. You still go to fanfiction.net? Man, yeah. I just got like seventh grade flashbacks. That's yeah. where Atlas went. All of his is here. <laughs> Archive of our own, too. I'll look there. That's, that's where I look. Yeah. Um, if you're looking for bad reading, no, Atlas is right. He's where he's supposed to that's be. That's true. That's <laughs> true. Um, but yeah, so uh, this one, it's a, the little thing at the beginning is it is 1965, and Regina's grandmother, Cordelia, appears to have everything, yet she is miserable. Years later, Cordelia shares her story of deep sadness and pain, but also of love with Regina, Gretchen, and their friends. T just to be safe for some pretty heavy themes. So, yeah. We got we got a Mean Girls prequel. Uh, <laughs> Children can handle heavy themes, but each to their own. But, like, this is fanfiction.net heavy, so... <laughs> yeah, when you were like, oh, it's so edgy to say the F word. Yeah. Gotta put a teen rating on that. <laughs> Might be edgy. If you were 12 and your mom didn't know you were writing a fan fiction story, you know, like, that would be a pretty edgy thing for a 12-year-old to do. Admittedly. I'm um, always I gonna put... take the fanfic writer's side. I feel... No, no, no. Like, I'm, I've been there because I've been someone who wrote a fan fiction. I don't know what my account is. I don't remember the name. But I remember I wrote a fan fiction and it had, like, teen smoking in it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, and I was like, it's got to be teen because it's like a teenager he's smoking and that's bad. So, like, I have to rate it, like, mature or teen or something. I don't remember. That's teen. You don't know that you wouldn't be able to find your, find it again. But we'll, I'll let you slide this time. I mean, I'm sure if I looked up the keywords of what I was looking for, I could find it if I if I tried. I don't want to try. Come <laughs> on, our terrible writings part three. Come on. <laughs> Something I wrote when I was what twelve. Let's not go there. I mean, this is the bad. This is the wrong place to bring it up if you don't <laughs> want so anyone to go there in the future. Well, That's true. <laughs> The, but all they know is that there's a teenager smoking in it, and that is all. So good luck trying to figure out which fan fiction it is. <laughs> there, there are so many things that I hope to read on this show one day. Unfortunately, there is a lost episode of this show uh, with Dan Grove, who's been on before. And he uh, it, it's a project he did when he was in, like, fifth grade that he <laughs> read to me. And unfortunately, the file corrupted, so I couldn't upload it. Oh, and it's lost forever, and I hope he gives it another try someday. But I don't know if he's like got the guts to do it again, because I really had to drag it out of him. I'm like, please come on and read it. Oh my gosh, so. that's awful, and it got lost. Yeah. Did Did you guys have like those story writing contests where they would like publish your books, but all they did was just like bind the story that you wrote? Yes. 
They have, did... That's been around for a long time. There's actually, I don't remember what exactly it was, but there was a 50s contest that targeted housewives. And it was a scam, and all the housewives got taken for their money. But what actually ended up happening is that there was a bunch more writers in the housewives' children's generation because they grew up mm-hmm. watching their moms all write at the table and wanted to copy them. So, but they're yeah. usually scams. Oh, yeah. uh, uh... this was for school, and they did. I won the writing contest a couple of years in a row, so I have some bound books that I, I will show you. If if you must see them at some point, Atlas. I please. Just trying to please. redirect you away from the teenage smoking fan Yeah. Fiction. yeah I mean... No, but like, at least you got a bound book. My school just did like we went to Kinko's and got it laminated. <laughs> That's publishing. <laughs> All right. Uh, so, as always, a uh, link to the story will be in the show notes. Give the artist credit if you want to go find it. You know how it is. All right. So. Uh, Kick it off here, the prologue, Cordelia and Gretchen. It seems like no matter what, Gretchen is always in a hurry. She could leave half an hour early and still show up late, out of breath, flustered and apologizing like crazy. In fact, sorry I'm late has become her default greeting. She's feeling more flustered than usual today, butterflies in her stomach, as she enters Pine Hills Assisted Living to see Regina's grandmother without Regina. Pine Hills looks like a more fancy hotel or the most luxurious apartment complex in the world than an assisted living, with a fountain at the entrance and enormous, modern-looking windows. Truth be told, her dorm at Overland looks much more old-fashioned. When Gretchen first heard that Regina's relatively young grandmother, at 72, Cordelia was a good two decades younger than Grandma Olga, was moving to an assisted living after a hip injury, she was surprised, even as Regina uh, told her it was temporary, and mostly because neither Henry nor Regina's Aunt Lucille wanted Cordelia anywhere near them, and Cordelia, who liked her space, didn't want to be stuck with a live-in nurse. <clears throat> Cordelia's own house was so large and contained so many staircases, it didn't seem reasonable. Plus, it was much too big for one person, and Regina's grandmother had died years ago, or grandfather, sorry, had died years ago. Okay, she she didn't have a lesbian. Okay. Uh, You did it. I get it. I I, wonder when the story will start. Well, it's either that or she's a ghost. Like, she died years ago, but she's still in the house somewhere. No, it's me reading stuff wrong. Uh, Before Regina, Ricky, and Kyle had even been born. Looking at. I want that movie. I want uh, the ghost of. Like a Mean Girls, but like also a horror movie, but it to be very tongue in cheek. I I want this movie. Mean Girls Halloween. Yeah. What, what, mean girl, like Mean Girls Halloween, but tongue in cheek. That's like halfway to Heather's. It's dark comedy in a different way. Yes. Okay. Surprised um, there hasn't like been that. Halloween. I guess there are. You know, maybe if the Halloween party had just taken a very different turn in the movie, <laughs> we would have had it. All right. Um, let's see. Looking at it, Pine Hills now, however, Gretchen thinks that one could almost ignore the circumstances and pretend, Cord- uh, pretend Cordelia and her housemates were guests at, a posh, uh, guests at a posh resort. May I help you? Asked the... <laughs> <laughs> Fine. Th- this is the falsetto voice you get. I'm sorry. Um, Love it. May I help you? Asked the perky, perfectly made-up woman behind the counter. You want to be Gretchen? Sure. Uh, she was the one with brown hair, right? Yeah, she she was like yeah. the rich girl. Yeah. Okay. Um, oh, secret. God, what did they even sound like? I know. It's been that... a long time since I've seen the movies. I've listened to the musical, some of the songs, the ones that I like a lot, and listened to Heather's a lot more. So. Uh... I know Amanda Seyfried has kind of like the. She like... was the one that she was like, we should all just totally stab Caesar. Yeah. <laughs> Oh yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Says Gretchen. Um, I'm here to visit Cordelia George. Sorry, I'm late. She uh she adds. The woman looks down at her watch. They should be at lunch now. She says, out on the veranda. Um. Uh, Cordelia, an old lady. Oh. <laughs> says Cordelia, looking up from the nur- uh, from the nurse, a large black woman named Trisha. Do you hear? She is now. Oh, 
now I told you my granddaughter and her friend were coming. Trisha rolls her eyes and stalks away, per uh, per perhaps to bother some other resident. Sorry, I'm late. Gretchen says again, in what is possible an even smaller, more timid voice than oh, she's... Oops. <laughs> I mean, whatever. Uh, than she is used to at the front desk. Um, Cordelia shrugs good-naturedly. What are a few more minutes? I'm old after all. <laughs> Says that. I feel like if you're old, you're going to be like, hurry the fuck up. What? Yeah. 72, Cordelia. Yeah. <laughs> hey, let's put on down. You're, you're barely into retirement age. You're spry. Seriously. <laughs> Not that Especially old. nowadays. Yeah. Do you think that, like, they have, like, you know how when you were in elementary school, like, you, like, the first graders would get picked on by the fourth graders just because they were older? So, like, may maybe you have sure. that in, like, a nursing home where it's, like, the Well, I'm pretty sure. Oh, sorry, sorry, go on. No, 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 J just, like, the 90-year-olds are picking on the 70-year-olds because they haven't been I think been it's the so other long. way around since if you push over a 90-year-old, they <laughs> shout, like, less. Yeah. I mean... Not, but not, you know, you can be mean as you want, but... <laughs> I push. feel like the the brunt of the abuse in retirement homes is probably not going to come from the retirees. No, it's not. I'm not bring it down that low. <laughs> all right. We all know about elder abuse. I mean, the elder... fan fiction time. Like... <laughs> well, okay, now, now I'm imagining like a version of Animal Farm, but it's all old people <laughs> instead of animals. Yes, the elders rise up. <laughs> One of them's named Murray, because there's always an old person named Murray. Always. Uh, uh, Gretchen can't quite tell if she's joking or not, but she smiles anyway. Anyway. Why don't we go outside? Cordelia suggests, uh, although with Cordelia, suggestions are demands. We could have some tea. When Gretchen first met Regina in fifth grade, it was almost like meeting royalty. Her cool, regal confidence radiated from her. She seemed both distant and utterly approachable at the same time. Cordelia is exactly the same way. Even at 72, she is beautiful. Her silver hair pulled into a tight bun. Her firm jawline with full lips giving the smallest trace of a smile. Or is it a smirk? Her perfectly filed nails were shiny. Her posture straight and her head held high. Grandma Old, uh, Olga's skin was saggy and yellow-tinted. <laughs> But Cordelia's wrinkles. <laughs> Gonna shame people for their livers not working. But the old is apparently not good looking. I know. Like I, I, I don't get why this is like a thing where, you're, where like you're taking notice of her appearance. Like, yeah, uh, Regina's grandma is way more fuckable than mine is. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, even just like. Oh, this grandmother is so much cooler than mine. Okay, she's cool. Yeah, but <laughs> not. She's, I think she's Olga smoking. sounds like she's had a life, and I want to meet her. To be honest, I feel like I'd rather party with Olga. The way this yeah. goes. Agreed. Well, she seems like like the the grandma who's like, "Hey, you want? I got some black tar heroin from the <laughs> war." <laughs> no, but she'll be like, "Hey, I got whiskey and cookies," and I'm like, "Olga, you've done it again, <laughs> bad bitch." And then we have a great time. Um. Cordelia's wrinkles around her mouth and eyes are barely visible. At first, Gretchen was just as afraid of Cordelia as she was initially of uh, Regina, but somehow Cordelia had taken to her almost immediately. Um, Any friend of Regina's is a friend of mine, she had said, and Gretchen felt warm and tingly in the pit of her stomach. It sounds like she's, like, crushing on the 72-year-old, like, old lady. I always thought that both Mean Girls and Heathers could have been so much better if they had leaned into those kind of vibes that were already in the movies. You know? Be like, yeah. You know? The lesbian vibes? Yeah. All up in those movies. Did you did you see the meme recently that went around of, um, of like, girls bullying? And it was, like, stock images of, like, girls bullying but really it was just very homoerotic pictures of like teen girls like all up in each other's business 
No, but I did. I related to this story I read so online so hard that was like, I had this crush on this girl in my class in fourth grade, and I didn't know what to do about it. So I just wrote her a note that said, get out of my school. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, Regina George, and is that you? But also, like. That's also got some, like, Eric Cartman energy to it. That. Get out of my school. <laughs> get out of my school. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Because when you're that little, you don't know how to deal with things like that. You're like, I don't, I don't understand. Well, because, yeah. like, e- even the kids who are, like, a little vicarious and are okay with telling people, like, that's already few and far between. But just the thing where, where you go, like, what happens if a girl likes a girl? And they're like, you don't do that shit. You're like, yeah, okay. <laughs> like, <laughs> I just Hopefully always that's... felt like whenever Regina was like, well, I had to stop being friends with janet because i couldn't have a lesbian at my pool party and i was like it sounds like you were really into janet <laughs> like seriously gina well right? oh my gosh mm-hmm. and then like at the end she's what on the on the rugby team or something and i'm like she is on the rugby team yeah to, <laughs> like to okay. take control of her anger apparently i would i would watch this sequel i don't want it to have any drama i want a rom-com with gina george and janet <laughs> Yes. Later. Okay. See now. Now I want to start writing like Hallmark movies where you just—it's a sequel to whatever the thing is, but all the same beats of a Hallmark <laughs> movie. <laughs> yeah. So like, uh, it's years later. Regina George comes back to her hotel hometown after being a big city lawyer for twenty years and learns to recapture the Christmas spirit. Also, it snows in <laughs> California. Out. What is it coming out? Can I watch it now? I would. <laughs> I'm going to write it, and then I'm going to come back on the show to read it to you guys. I, but let... I still need to, uh... So, so many spec scripts I haven't finished. I haven't even finished editing the Seinfeld one that you saw, where you're like, you gotta do this shit, too. I haven't touched it since then. <laughs> so, Isn't that the way it goes? Yeah. Uh, yeah. For, if uh, if you want to hear more about that spec script, there, Our Terrible Writings Volume 2. Um, Alright. Let's see... So, pit of her stomach, so where's Regina? Uh, so where's Regina? Cordelia asks. Oh. Says Gretchen quickly. Uh, she went to Dairy Queen. She'll be here soon. Cordelia wrinkles her nose. Dairy Queen? It's much too cold for that. Anyway, while we're waiting, you may as well sit down. So... She asks after taking a dainty sip of tea, the way fancy ladies in movie, uh, movies about the Victorian era England do. This really, really does seem more and more like a, a Hallmark special movie. <laughs> How are things going with Mike? Gretchen bites her lip. Ugh. She says, Oh, Cordelia. not bad. <laughs> <laughs> One thing Gretchen really likes about Cordelia is that she really takes the time to listen when Gretchen complains. Then again, it could be she has nothing better to do, but it's still better than Gretchen's mother, who still insists Mike is the best thing since sliced bread, or Regina, who keeps insisting that Gretchen just break up with him already. I don't really know what to do anymore, Gretchen says. It's all about him and his problems all the time. I mean, I want to help him, she adds, perhaps a little too vehemently. But I'm just so tired of feeling like he's more important than me. Cordelia is quiet for a moment. Do you love him? She asks. I, I, I don't know. Gretchen replies. She thought about this a lot. She uh, knows she used to before Mike started calling her in the middle of class, angry that she couldn't drop everything to hang out with him, before he lost his temper at her for not wanting to share a poem she wrote in eighth grade and a writer's workshop, before he was diagnosed with an illness of the brain that made it impossible uh, to blame him for any of his erratic behavior. Wait, what? Should I be concerned about this young woman and her high school boyfriend who wrote this? Should I... Did I message her? I think so. It's, uh... Well, it sounds like she was on her... Maybe she'd just broken up with somebody. It sounds like this is, this is the words of somebody who had just broken up with them. You know what? She's okay. She, took, yeah. she went through her feelings in this fanfic. She got it out. I'm proud of her. Okay. This was, when was this written? In 2016? Yeah, she's fine. Oh, she's... yeah. <laughs> Actually, when in 2016 was this written? This was written Learned May. Okay, so that's like the beginning of the summer of Pokemon Go before Trump was elected. So like, 
Maybe she was talking about Squirtle all along. Rare. <laughs> <laughs> That was like the closest we ever got to world peace, I think, was that summer. I never, yeah. Like you just had people walking around like everywhere. All the plants, in the traffic. My Ooh, phone didn't that. run. It was innocent yeah. times. Yeah, innocent times of people dying randomly. Oh, and people being like, this is an epidemic. <laughs> people keep walking into traffic because they're having too much fun. <laughs> Everyone would sense was like, we can lose those people, though. Like, we <laughs> probably can. Maybe. I'm feeling. And then I remember there was that story about people finding some old dead body while they were trying yeah. to catch Pokemon. Well, that's just like monkeys on a keyboard, you know? Like, eventually someone's going to find a body. Yeah. <laughs> the I'm like, this isn't a bad thing. That you're going to find a body. <laughs> it just turns into, like, an accidental stand by me. Where you're like, oh, we accidentally had had a wonderful uh, childhood defining moment together, but you, you were you were on Team Mystic, so fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was again. I I kind of missed that. Like I would walk around with people who were playing Pokemon Go, but my phone at the time didn't run it. Mm -hmm. um, and by the time I upgraded to a new phone, it was like past the the prime of Pokemon Go. Yeah. So I did miss the bus. Uh, but I remember, you know? I remember between friends, the arguments about what team to go for. What were you going to say, Kat? I did too. I just missed the bus too. That's oh. it. Um, I remember. <laughs> Cordelia up too. Let's get back. Yeah. Um, let's see. Something, something. Cord uh, Cordelia ponders for a second. Ah. Uh. They certainly can be, especially when one of the partners is sick. You should be kind to him. He's going through something very difficult. And also, he's not going to be around for very much longer. She didn't Damn. say that, but... No. I mean, if he's diagnosed with an illness of the brain that makes it impossible to blame him for any of his erratic behavior, as it says in the previous paragraph, he's probably going to die soon. Well, that took, that took a left turn. I thought it was just going to be like, dump his ass. <laughs> Perhaps. Aw, oh, Gretchen thinks here it is again. The same old you have to be nice and patient with him and be the bigger person bullshit. She's used to hearing from practically everyone ever, aside from Regina, who never liked Mike in the slightest. At the same time, though, Cordelia says, you're going through something difficult, too, and at some point you have to put yourself first. You should be kind to yourself, too. Uh, was it like that for you and Regina's grandpa? Gretchen asks. Was it hard, I mean? Yes. Cor says Cordelia, looking straight ahead, her eyes sad and v far away. Very hard. Cordelia just struck a pose a little yeah. bit. Yeah. <laughs> Very hard. Yeah. <laughs> How did you meet him, anyway? Actually. Says Cordelia. I was just about your age, a little younger even. I had just finished my first year of college at we Wes Wesley. This weird Wes Wesley? Wesleyan. No, it's not Wesleyan, it's just Wesley. It's not Wesleyan? I don't know. I, I see, look at me, making an Don't. ass of myself, assuming right away. We Wesley. Wesley Sicily. Something. <laughs> w E L L E S L E Y. Wellesley. That's it. Like, okay. you're overthinking Wellesley. it. Wellesley. Wellesley. <laughs> and I can't pronounce it because I'm old, and that's my excuse. And I don't <laughs> think I, I had ever been so miserable. So, dot, dot, dot. Yeah, so that's the end of the first chapter, and that's, like, the framing device. This is our uh, G Gina Davis and old person makeup finding the catcher's mitt in the suitcase. This is uh, Rose <laughs> with the Heart of the Ocean. That's, like, our framing device. It um, immediately makes me think of the Princess Bride and the uh, the grandpa coming in with this, the book to read. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, oh no, the, the only reason I brought up A League of Their Own was uh, I had to miss two days of work last week because my roommate interacted with somebody who uh, had COVID. So both he and I had to self-isolate while we got tested. I watched all of the baseball movies. <laughs> all of them. <laughs> It happens every spring. Movie from the fifties. Watched it. 
League of Their Own, watched it. Both major leagues and both Sandlots. Watch those both. I saw a dog that looked like the beast from Sandlot earlier today. Was it was, was, was he pettable? He was. Yay. Oh. Was it a mastiff? I don't think I No, it was Beast from Sandlot. I've never seen that movie, so Are you serious? What? Yeah. I, I, Very, you have a that's something for you to look forward to. It's a good time. It's you know, have a hard day, throw on Sandlot, it'll be fun. I can't believe I'm saying this because it's so cliche, but you're killing me, Smalls. <laughs> Say it. I'm disappointed I didn't say it. <laughs> Get that joke once you watch it. Don't worry. There's so many things I haven't seen, as Atlas will tell you. It it, it happens. There's like gaps in our media knowledge uh, that like. Really... It's always weird when when someone like gets actively angry at you. We're like, yeah. you haven't seen this? Blasphemy! <laughs> you know. I'll bully you into watching it because that always works. <laughs> the reason i can't watch jojo's bizarre adventure all my all my freaking friends ruined it for me oh yeah all right so uh th- this next chapter um you want to want to be the main narrator and then i'll do all the voices <laughs> um sure yeah this is the first time i've ever read this so let's just see how it goes some people are just born broken with something missing in their hearts or souls or minds, or perhaps even a combination of all three. Cordelia is quickly beginning to realize she is one of these people. What else could explain it? After all, her father has so kindly pointed out half a million times she has everything a person could want. A mansion with a swimming pool, surrounding a silver fountain, eight thoroughbred horses, boys lined up wanting to date her, and more diamond necklaces than any sane person could possibly want. Wait, wait, hang on. And- so there, there's the pool that's surrounding a fountain. So there's a fountain and then, like, a pool around it. I mean, there are circular there, pools. Therefore, like, concrete just in the middle of this pool? Like, to so hold <laughs> the fountain? Yeah. Is it that, like, does the fountain feed into the or pool it, and like, vice versa? Or like, fountain and water parks. Yeah. yeah. That's what I'm thinking of. I don't like... think that's it, though. <laughs> I can't, somehow I have a hard time picturing a bunch of diamond necklaces, which is, that's too many. You should have one diamond necklace, maybe two. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't have a bunch of diamond necklaces. Also eight horses. I feel like we're overlooking that. (laughs) Exactly the correct amount of horses. That is too many horses. I don't know. Eight eight thoroughbred horses is too many thoroughbred horses. My eight horsepower wagon. They need to... (laughs) But... What even what is, what is thoroughbred anyway? Is it like the thing where oh, you're bred for horses? Okay, so so incest basically. Um, thoroughbred horses are the ones they use for horse racing. Thoroughbred horse go fast, win money. Oh yeah. See, I yeah, I, those... I thought it was like thoroughbred has a pure bloodline, and then that's how you get uh, Charles and his giant fucking baseball bat chin. Uh, <laughs> they do. Happen they... every now and then. Yeah, they are super, super inbred. And there's actually a problem with um, them not having great fertility now because Mm -hmm. that's that's just a thing. I don't maybe the faster horses don't have great sperm. I I don't know. Use the ball their speed on running. Yeah, (laughs) but it is is something and they're they're very they're very neurotic. And if a horse is going to accidentally like freak out and kick you in the face and kill you, it's going to be a thoroughbred horse. No wonder Cordelia is so stressed out. She's got to do <laughs> this every day. Do you guys watch American Dad? A little bit. Did you ever see the episode where uh, they put Stan's brain in a horse's body? No. Okay, so uh, he, he like, they're having money troubles, so Roger convinces him to buy a horse. And like bet on the horse to to win money, and uh, while they're like getting it ready for the race, he he like jokingly tells Stan to jack off the horse to like help get it ready, and then he does, and then the horse is traumatized, so they have to swap the brains of the horse and Stan. So it, so Stan is in the horse's body for most of the episode, and like there's a thing where Roger keeps telling Stan on, Fra- like, telling Francine about all the stuff they're doing and getting Stan in trouble. So after he gets turned into to a horse, he's like, hey, there's another trainer I can do. And then Roger gets behind him and then Stan just kicks him in the face. <laughs> Stop telling Francine on me! 
I love that. I would kick people in the face if I was a horse every yeah. day. But then again, I kick people in the face now. So Not the difference is the lethality of it. Right. I know. That's what I'm missing. I agree. <laughs> Eric, do they need uh, stronger hind legs if you if you want to pull that off? Work on them haunches. <laughs> you guys don't are rubbing salt right in the wound. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so, I I also have to work. Like I face first. I no have lost. Them. I mean, everyone no, everyone not. has done bad in COVID. Can't like, wait. Yeah. I was just saying you're fifth on the list. Um, <laughs> okay. Wanted to make sure you felt safe. Okay. Gotta work <laughs> down. Oh, where was I? I don't uh, remember. Beginning of the second paragraph, I think. Okay. Yeah. And as for the horses, she hates them. Ah, oh, there we go. Oh. <laughs> yeah. She hated them growing up when her father would spend days on end preparing for horse shows and snipping at her whenever she tried to talk to him about anything else. She hated them when her friends at school, horse crazy like any other preteen in the the county not named Cordelia squealed about how lucky she was and she especially hates them now as she stumbles out of Nick's new black Porsche and stares at the tasteful party that has nothing to do with her homecoming uh, from her first year at Wellesley. Got it. That, that, uh, <laughs> that pains you to say, doesn't it? It doesn't look like that's how it should be pronounced. I know. It's like I don't know, so many words like that where, where it you know, uh, I still can't say Worcestershire. Sure, so there you go. Worcestershire. Worcestershire. Oh my god, it is really yeah. hard. <laughs> my that's like one of my dad's favorite jokes when I was a kid, where he's like, "Hey, d- did you know where Worcestershire sauce came from?" And I'm like, "No." And he goes, "Well, King Henry the Eighth asked his chef to make him a new sauce, and uh, he did, and then he put it on a dish, and then." King Henry, with a mouthful of food, said, "Worst is here, sauce." And then that's what the yeah. it's like. <laughs> such a dad joke, and like, uh, yeah, that's a clever dad joke, though. Yeah. Shout out, shout out to my dad. Hope he's doing well. Um, I love his dad. Uh, her head is killing her, yeah. possibly literally, but this is nothing new. Ever since the day she started freshman semester, she had a migraine every single Wednesday. Actually, every single Thursday, too, now that she thinks about it. And at least every other Saturday also. Jesus, she needs to be tested for a brain tumor. She's not even sure if there are separate headaches or just variations on the same long, drawn-out migraine. In either case, it's a, uh, it's different every time. Some days she wakes up with it, a band of pain across her eyes. Some days it's sharp like an ice pick, other, others dully throbbing like a hammer. Sometimes she sees all kinds of flashing lights. Some days she feels icy cold all over, as if she's been doused in liquid nitrogen. Delia, this is not, this is not okay. No. Also, that's like some very vivid imagery. I gotta give the the guy props yeah. for that one. Yeah. Doctors. Yeah, like she's super rich. Like you can I describe feel it like... yourself in a lot of detail. Maybe we describe it into a phone. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is also like. The 60s, right? Maybe she's so, afraid of the lobotomy, the headache away. Very yeah, that's Atlas. Like, yeah, so it's, so it's the like the 60s. Type. Yeah, they're like it's hysteria, lobotomy. You know. Did the 60s? Did they still do lobotomies in the 60s? 60s? Vaguely, I don't know. Yeah, early 60s they did. Okay, I don't know when it. Went I don't know about the... lobotomy. I know they did hysteria. Yeah, they definitely. I mean, hysteria was still a thing, and like, I mean, it's still a thing to some people, which is annoying. <laughs> Um, really is going through it. <sighs> anyway, hopefully she won't get a lobotomy, but uh, she should be telling a doctor here. Um, while others, she feels sweaty and overheated, but it's always there, draped over her like a shawl. Today is a special kind of headache, though, one that somehow manages to combine all the worst qualities of her usual migraines. It comes in alternating waves of sharp hot pain behind her eyes and dull throbbing across her sinuses. Her jaw aches as if all of her teeth are about to crumble out of her skull. She's lightheaded too. And it feels like the ground is moving, even though they're outside of her car. I mean, if she feels like all the teeth are going to crumble out of her skull, maybe she should have a dog kick her into a desk. Maybe that'll get the ball rolling. Oh my god, Atlas! (laughs) (laughs) 
or hip check you, whatever. Oh, <laughs> I forgot about that story. So I was like, coming in hot. Oh, you just thought I was being like super that? dark? No, it's a callback. I 100% forgot. <laughs> That's because it's late on a Wednesday night. Listen, no one said I had to retain, okay? <laughs> so, Fair enough. remember that. Oh, God, God forbid somebody's listening to this in chunks, like, all right, I'm going to go to bed and listen to the rest of the morning, and then they just forget, and they're like, what the fuck? <laughs> well, now they know. Dog hip check my two front teeth out when I was two. There, there's your... I think everybody else probably has a better memory than me. Yeah. Um... Where was I? Uh, dull throbbing. Oh, well, wet. Well. <laughs> says Nick, slamming the door behind him. Here we are. Here we <laughs> are. <laughs> I'll be everybody. It's fine. Okay. Yeah. Cordelia replies flatly. He claps a hand on her shoulder and she flinches. Welcome home, Cordy. Cordy? <laughs> I told you not to call me that. Cordelia says tightly. She meant it to sound lighthearted and teasing, but instead it sounds like she's choking on the words. Now that she's here, she realizes she's nervous. She hasn't seen her parents since Christmas break. And that was certainly a less than ideal experience, as her father had been too worried about how Aurelius had been limping recently, and her mother kept bothering her about why she didn't have a boyfriend yet. Just like it, Wellesley, her nervousness has the odd effect of making her tired, completely drained, actually, and she longs for her bed. She suddenly feels like she might throw up, even though she hasn't eaten since this morning when she had M&Ms for breakfast. That is the most relatable sentence I've ever heard. Ah, oh, the college Says life. 1960s debutante to me. Yeah. <laughs> so, you think mom and dad have someone new to set you up with? Asks Nick. Is Nick her brother? think so okay um, it's really unclear yeah it may, maybe it's like a could be a butler but i don't think a butler would talk to them that way so i'm gonna guess brother okay um, it's butler i'm gonna guess brother butler who's yeah. falling out of the family <laughs> <laughs> oh, you, falling you, out of favor earning you, his way back you've been demoted to butler from <laughs> <That's right. laughs> For some reason, Cordelia thinks the only way to prevent herself from hurling all over the driveway is to keep talking. So she does just that, uh, talking a little too quickly and possibly a little too loudly. I don't <laughs> think so! Oh, right, sorry. <laughs> she says. Wouldn't that take away the attention from Princess Charlemagne? Charlemagne, that is Prince Charlemagne, not Princess, is Rodolfo's newest stallion, who apparently just won a major horse show of some sort. Perhaps not coincidentally, Rodolfo and Jane purchased Charlemagne only two weeks before Cordelia left for college. Cordelia can't help but feel slightly bitter about this. Nick's smile is a bit tense, more of a smirk than anything, and Cordelia's pulse speeds up. You know, I bet I'm the only girl in history of ever who didn't want horses growing up, she says. I always wish there was something else, like maybe llamas or birds or ostriches or something. Or maybe, like, a random assortment of penguins. Cordelia was well aware that ostriches and penguins are, in fact, birds. But she's also well aware that she's feeling slightly hysterical. Maybe she and Nick would have been better off stopping at a psych ward on the way home. Nick shakes his head, sighs, and turns away from her. Yeah, Cordelia, I know you feel like that. We grew up together, remember? We've had this exact same conversation. Cordelia is shocked by the venom in his voice. What? She says stupidly, even though she knows very well what he said. Nick curls his lip like an angry dog, or like the horses when they are displeased. Wait, wait, hang on. What does that look like? like a... I don't... I mean, I know that horses lift up their, their like top lip when they're... Uh, well, the stallions do when they're sniffing at mares that they're into, but I don't think that that's what they do. Saying a lot for a horse, you know, it's a lot of derision. Yeah. I I don't know. My my sister rode horses when I was growing up, and I I just stayed away from them. I don't like horses very much. Ah. I worked with thoroughbreds at a, a rehab center, so 
I have experience with thoroughbreds and their neurotic behaviors. Were, were, were the horses getting rehabbed or was it like people? Was it... it was the horses that were getting rehabbed. These were like million dollar horses that had like injuries and they needed to be rehabilitated so they could get back on the track and win. Oh, these you know, you're deep yeah. in the know. Yeah, Chris has this thing where they'll randomly have like a very deep well of knowledge for the most random stuff. <laughs> <laughs> All of the most useless information. I yeah. disagree. It's useful. I now am delighted with horse facts. There yeah. you go. One use. It's like the thing where, you know that meme where uh, somebody pretends like, thanks for signing up for cat facts. Did you know blah, blah, blah. And just sending a new cat fact every day. And then it's the thing where the guy's like yelling at them, stop sending me cat facts. <laughs> Fun fact, they're, they're com, Like the entire entity of cat facts. <laughs> Apparently that's my spirit animal that I have just discovered right now. I mean, Quasar is cat. Quasar is cat. Quasar is not my spirit animal. She is real dumb. She's very trainable, real dumb. Those are not the same thing. Something can be extraordinarily trainable and also very, very stupid. She is very, very stupid and very, very trainable. Yeah. She's also beautiful. She is like the quintessential everything that you would want in a bimbo. She's beautiful. She's sweet and kind and nice, dumb, and will follow directions. Can her boobs tell what the weather is? Uh, you'd have to ask her. Uh, <laughs> there's a 40% chance it's already raining or whatever. Uh, I want to live with her and make her breakfast. I love her, Karen. <laughs> She's great. I just, it, like, Karen is the opposite of a Karen. She's just kind of like, like... She's too dumb for malice. Yeah. She has, yeah. She has no time for that. <laughs> God, I'm so sick of you. <laughs> his voice, uh, yeah, his voice. Uh, his His voice is cold, sharp, almost inaudible. What? Says Cordelia again. What do you mean you're sick of me? The pounding in her head has suddenly increased tenfold and her skin prickles. Although he is 13 years older than she is, Nick has always been there and has never been anything but patient in his sarcastic joking, often manic way, even when, yes, admittedly, her complaining was somewhat annoying. Forget it. Says Nick. No! Says Cordelia, her eyes prickling with tears. You can't just say something like that and then say forget it. What do you mean you're sick of me? Since when? What exactly about me are you so sick of? Nick sighs again. Just... One. <laughs> what? Example one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's just like, let me get out my list. And he just like <laughs> holds a piece of paper. Whenever I say something, you yell it back at me in my face like... <laughs> It, 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 it's like that meme where it's like uh, p depression is on the rise nowadays and then someone's like, well, I mean... <laughs> the list of the things. <laughs> Gestures broadly at everything. You know. <laughs> uh, he pauses. I don't know, just this. All you do is whine. I get it. You don't like horses. You don't like our parents. I know. I heard I was there. That was you won, brother. Yeah. What do you Cordelia's... mean? I, I won. We were betting on who he was. You got oh, oh yeah, it is brother. Yeah. He still might be demoted to butler. Maybe. We don't know that. <laughs> Cordelia feels her throat closing up. Oh, as if you're perfect. She asks, not entirely sure where this is coming from. You hate them too. You hate all of this too. Sure, maybe when I was a kid, yeah. But at some point, it's time to just grow out of this poor little rich girl routine. I mean, he's got a point. What, just kind of like take it on the chin and move on? Like, Well, I mean, like, she has money? Uh, I, I mean, she she definitely needs therapy. But, yeah. like, she's old enough to go get some therapy. Mm -hmm. And it... in those early 60s, she'd have to deal with Freud therapists. She'd be worse off. Oh, oh, you, that's you do got surreal. a point there. Yeah, because yeah, like, think about that. or like, if you did do therapy, it was like, oh, you keep that shit on the down low. No one can know you're going to therapy. You're crazy. Yeah. yeah. And, and then now everybody our age is like, yeah, man, I just had some mad therapy today. It was awesome. You know. Yeah, it was like <laughs> I cried so hard. It was the worst. It was great. 
I think that's one of my favorite things about our generation is just the like how open we are about our mental health. I mean, Craig Ferguson was super open about depression and he inspired a lot of people to get, especially in his age range, to get treatment for it. Yeah, so. especially with that delightful Scottish accent. You, you can get me to do anything. Love him. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All um, right, where were we? Uh, poor little rich girl routine. Cordelia hates Nick all of a sudden. And the feeling is so unusual, she's terrified. She feels somehow lost. Lost because Nick has always been the one person she could trust. And now even Nick is tired of her. And then she thinks that maybe Nick should be tired of her. And really, who wouldn't? Let's just go in. Says Nick, obviously pretending the conversation never happened. But Cordelia doesn't move. I feel sick. She says, staring up at the house. Nick throws his head back and sighs so dramatically Cordelia is uh, startled and turns to face him. Now what's your problem? Oh, now what's your problem? <laughs> Sorry, wrong person. Suddenly her voice is several octaves lower. Yeah. <laughs> she asks huffily. You feel sick? Go figure. Why don't, when don't you feel sick? Nick says coldly. It's true, Cordelia has to admit. Ever since the semester began, she has constantly felt sick in at least one way. It's not her head, it's her stomach. When it's not her stomach, her throat. At first she thought it was a normal freshman problem. But she knows in her heart that it isn't normal to go through each and every day with a knot in her stomach, a lump in her throat, and a constant dizzy feeling she cannot seem to shake. Still, the way Nick brings it up so condescendingly, so maliciously even, makes her angry. I don't know, I feel like the constant freshman problem of, like, everything is terrible. Uh, <laughs> like... <laughs> In like a, well, just like the you're away from home for the first time. There's all these classes you're not quite used to. Everything is awful. I don't yes. know. I had a, an Sad okay time. When you're all by yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I liked going to college my freshman year. The one thing that I didn't like about it was that I didn't have any pets. But I had the benefit of going to a college where there was like a break into a bowl area of farm animals. So I could just go spend time with them at the end of my day and defragment and then go back, take a shower and go to sleep. But it could I be those llamas and she'll be good to go. Yeah, there you go. We didn't have any llamas. Uh, uh, goats? We did, we had, yeah, goats, um, pigs, sheep, cows. The cows were always out like in the pasture though. I didn't really interact with them, but like hang out with the goats and like this one, very large boar that thought it was much smaller than it actually it was like i don't know 500 600 pounds and it would sit it's like head in my lap and i was like i can't feel my legs after a little while it was great see now i'm thinking like i'm imagining the what's the from one of hercules's 12 labors it's like something with a boar yeah he's gonna kill a boar i'm imagining that it was yeah essentially that's i would probably it's what we looked like because that boar was literally like six times my size <laughs> very sweet very sweet large animal so smart always liked when i brought it food from like the the mess hall that i probably shouldn't have but it didn't matter no one was watching <laughs> um all right where were we uh you're right she snaps. You don't have to be such an asshole about it, though. Cordelia suddenly wants to strike back at Nick and to hurt him as much as he hurt her. Maybe Mom and Dad are trying to set you up with someone for... Er, oh, maybe Mom and Dad are trying to set you up with someone for once. She says, glaring at him. It's so ridiculously sexist that they're worried about me not being married yet when you've never even had a girlfriend, hypocritical much. Cordelia has long believed that Nick's either gay or asexual. Wait, did they what? know about asexuality in the 60s? I mean, they definitely knew about gay people. What? Also thinking she might need to be dropped off by the psych ward. She's a, she's a complicated bird, our Cordelia. <laughs> I mean, th that's pretty cool of her to be like, she knows what asexuality is in the 60s. Um, yeah. yeah, if she does. Oh. Uh, this writer obviously thinks she does. But her family has, for some reason, never brought the... For some reason? I wonder what that reason could be. This rich, affluent family doesn't want to bring up the fact that her brother is possibly gay. Yeah. Never brought the subject up. 
Our only heir is sweet. That's all. It's a little sweet. <laughs> He probably still have a marriage of convenience set up somewhere. Maybe. Or or like the thing where, where it's like, he and his friend lived in a cabin in the middle oh of nowhere. A confirmed and, bachelor. And, and, and they were buddies, we swear, for the whole time. They were so humble, they chose only to have one bed. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm Frederick the Great, and I live with the guy, and then Hitler idolizes me, even though I was a, a giant homosexual. Good job, Frederick the Great. Secretive about it. He was just like, I I have a wife, but she lives way over there in that I have castle. I in Canada. I promise it's true. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then because it's the 1700s, what's Canada? It doesn't matter. She lives there. It's fine. <laughs> that... <laughs> Away from my like posse of like very attractive gentlemen that I keep with me at all times in my castle. <laughs> Um, let's see. Right. In, in fact, most of Nick's faults are a fault. That's not a fault. Most of Nick's faults are swept under the rug, including his often wild behavior, his tendency to quickly blow through money, and the fact that Rodolfo and Jane are still supporting him financially at the age of 32. Isn't that the way that things are, though, with rich people? Like, he doesn't have to worry about anything. He's going to be financially stable forever because he was born rich. Yeah, isn't that kind of the point? You're supposed to leave stuff to your kids or whatever? Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I'm not rich. We're not rich. <laughs> yeah, obviously, we don't know how the rich works. <laughs> yeah. Um, at least, at least when we do it, though, we don't we don't enact like toxic policy that uh, fucks over an entire, uh, you know, millions of people. We're not doing that. We're just making fun of them. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um. Was it? Oh, right. Yeah. Nick glares at Cordelia long and hard when suddenly Jane G- G- Giovici, I think so, uh, dressed in a bright Easter egg shade of blue dress and a large sun hat, emerges from the house, a tall martini glass in hand. Cordelia recently saw a horror movie called Invasion of the Body Snatchers, and she cannot think of a better way to describe her mother. Jane is permanently smiling so widely her jaw could dislocate and her face could snap in two. That's horrifying. Cordelia! Jane leans in and gives her daughter a light peck on the cheek, holding her at arm's length. How was the drive? Fine! Says Cordelia at the exact time Nick mutters. Awful. (laughs) Cordelia has to admit Nick is right about the drive. Five hours from outside Boston to Philadelphia that mainly consisted of Nick trying to convince Cordelia to eat something. And Cordelia making embarrassingly awkward small talk, such as when she thought the lunch Nick ordered was a fillet carved into the shape of a fish rather than an actual dead fish. Or when she tried to start a conversation about a receipt for wrapping paper that she found on the floor of the car. She knew she was being annoying, but somehow she couldn't stop the constant stream of ridiculousness that spewed out of her mouth. It was weird, because although Cordelia had been beyond socially awkward at Wellesley, she had always felt relatively at ease around Nick. Then again, Nick had seemed much less tolerant of her jokes than usual during the drive. And how was stool? Jane asks, ignoring Nick. Stool was, you know, stool, I guess. Says Cordelia, even though she knows this is a lame statement that doesn't make any sense. Jane eyes her carefully and squints, the wrinkles of her mouth turning slightly downward. You look so thin. You Haven't you been eating well? Cordelia remembers her breakfast of M&Ms and shrugs. The truth is, when you have a migraine almost three days every week, you lose much of your appetite. Can well, confirm is true. <laughs> <laughs> Rip. Well, you know how most freshmen gain 15 pounds? She says l- lightly. Guess it was kind of a reverse freshman 15 in my case. Lucky. Lucky bitch. No. <laughs> no, Atlas. What? To... You don't know what you're talking about. Well, not about the uh, migraines, about the losing the weight instead of gaining it. Not <laughs> even then? We still disagree. Neither of them are healthy. I, yeah, just try to stay at your healthy weight. 
don't aim to lose or gain, just to aim to be healthy. I mean, say say what you want, but uh, uh, flippity floppity has been a word to describe them sometimes. So flippity yeah. floppity. Yeah. Funny, yeah, but it but it's about man boobs, so it's fine. Uh... <laughs> I mean, I, I lost weight my first year, but it was mostly because I had a class that was like right before it ended, like as the dining hall closed. Oh, that's the worst. Yeah. So I like I, I had to sprint to try to get there to try to like before like they closed the doors. Mm-hmm. And if I got there in time, which some of the time I did, most of the time I didn't. All that was left were like these horrible turkey sandwiches. I cannot eat pesto with turkey to this day. Uh, <laughs> wait, so what, it wasn't even one of those classes you could like dip out ten minutes no. early. No, Mm-mm. that's the worst. That's always like the one where it's like six people in it. You're like, fuck, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> At least with the with the giant like lecture ones, you can like slip out and be like, I gotta get a sandwich in me that does not have pesto in it. <laughs> yeah i mean it was more like that class was like maybe 30 people but it was it was noticeable if somebody wasn't there mm. it was a smaller classroom yeah anyway um P- pesto and uh and uh, turkey is the worst so you're making me want a turkey pesto sandwich despite your best efforts i'm like mm, pesto this whole <laughs> time that's all i was thinking i was like mm, pesto <laughs> i do like pesto. i still Pesto is still good. I'm pretty sure it's still good. Pesto is still good, sure. just right. not with turkey. A little look into my thought process. <laughs> <laughs> that never happens. <laughs> Snips Jane. Snips Jane. Well, it must. Cordelia says her voice is uh, still light, even though her heart is racing. Or maybe I'm just special. <laughs> Jane rolls her eyes. Honestly, you look like a concentration camp victim. Dude. Did Wor- think- World War Two was only twenty years ago at this point. Too soon. Yeah, I don't think they joke. Yeah, they don't joke about yeah, that. Yeah, not very long. Nope, nope. Also, like, um, I don't know what the was it the beauty standards in the sixties being that slender, or was that like later on? I know that like heroin chic was like the nineties when Twiggy came out. She might in the seventies. I need to Google this. When was the heroin chic? No, no. When did when was Twiggy an influence? Yeah, because Twiggy definitely was like it. Nineteen uh, sixties. <laughs> All right. So, yeah. So she, yeah, she was the face of the sixties. All right. I was thinking that I was wondering why. I was also like, kind of seems like Jane would be happy her daughter was thin, but maybe yeah. she, now that she's thin enough to be ugly. Now we know. Yeah. Now you're like gaunt or whatever. Yeah. Or she's, I, I don't know. I mean, yeah, I mean, no, this is a white family. I can't say anything else. I I really hope that we get to meet the dad by the time time runs out of here because I'm going to bring back my Jay Peterman voice. Can't wait. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, here, I'll, I'll, I'll just take over. Uh, Cordelia thinks that Jane is one to talk. Perhaps Cordelia has lost some weight during freshman semester, but she still has more meat on her bones than Jane, who has always reminded her of a bobblehead or a jack-in-the-box with her oversized head and undersized arm, torso, and legs. <laughs> Cordelia is also, in spite of everything, surprised at Jane's reaction to her. Jane and Cordelia have never had anything more than a surface-level relationship. One that Cordelia thought worked much better when they were five hours apart. Referencing confer- uh, concentration camp victims, on the other hand, that's tasteless even for Jane. Well, Mom! <laughs> <laughs> Cordelia mumbles, that's incredibly tasteful! And I try to smile, says Jane bristly. You look l- uh, Oh, and try to smile. <laughs> and try to smile, Jane, uh, says Jane bristly. You'll look less creepy that way. I'm sorry if I pre-read that sentence you look like so I can't even. That's horrible. <laughs> uh, Cordelia grimaces and Jane smirks and strides back into the foyer. Maybe you should smile less, Cordelia says under her breath. You'll look less creepy that way, mommy dearest. Jeez. 
I mean, there are those people who smile way too much, and you're like, dude, can you can you just not? It's seven thirty in the morning. Shut yeah. up. Oh, yeah. Oh, morning people. Yeah. Um, let's see. Nick touches her shoulder lightly. You gonna be okay? He asks. Cordelia grinds her teeth together and nods, then shakes her head. The room is exceptionally loud, filled with laughter and uh, raucous conversations of people who are twice Cordelia's age, but somehow possess at least three times as much energy. It's called cocaine. In the 60s? Do they have... Oh yeah, coke was a thing. Um, <laughs> I've listened to 70s Black Sabbath. That's like 50% cocaine at least. Yeah. Um, let's see. Ugh, well, it'll only be a couple hours, right? Just a live, hopefully, she says. But Nick has already disappeared. Uh, Harry, you be, be this new person. All right. Cordelia, oh my god. She looks up to see her high school friend, Anne, face flushed and eyes sparkling happily, rushing towards her. It is all Cordelia can do to, uh, to attempt to match her friend's enthusiasm. It's not that she doesn't want to see Anne, she just would rather see Anne when she isn't uh, feeling ready to literally kill over. Anne, hi! Anne gives Cordelia a generous hug, but when they pull away, things become awkward. <laughs> How's Wellesley? Asks Anne. It's good, says Cordelia. How's Brown? Gray? Says Anne. <laughs> I love the voice you're doing. <laughs> oh, it's great. It's the... Um... <laughs> What's the SNL sketch with the ladies who sound like that? What a weather. What? What a weather? What, yeah, that one. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, things shouldn't be so awkward. Anne has, has been uh, Cordelia's best friend since first grade when they were paired together for a diorama assignment, a word that, as first graders, they couldn't stop laughing at and comparing to diarrhea. <laughs> sure. Uh if things are awkward, it is entirely Cordelia's fault. When they both left for school, she and Anne had agreed to call each other from the dorm, dorm telephones at least once a week. Early in the semester, Anne had constantly uh, kept up her end of the bargain and was always overflowing with enthusiasm about her classes and her fun roommate and her potential new boyfriend. Cordelia, on the other hand, quickly came to dread the weekly phone calls and eventually started to pretend to accidentally forget to call Anne, or more frequently to accidentally not be around when Anne called. That's sad. Uh, that is sad. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus, Cordelia. Wellesley was uh, an incredibly old school and didn't allow phones in the room, so all calls had to be made in public. Uh, Cordelia told herself that this was at least part of the reason for the awkwardness, but the truth was, compared to Anne, she had embarrassingly little to report. If they had still been in high school, Cordelia would have been able to gossip about and make fun of her 90-year-old civics professor and her uptight roommate Ariel for hours on end, making Anne snort with laughter with her completely over-the-top descriptions of everything. But now, separated by a scant 60-minute min uh, commute, she found that her mouth was dry and that words, sarcastic barbs and all, died in her throat. <laughs> Damn. Uh... Gradually, talking to Anne became one of the many things Cordelia no longer enjoyed. In high school, despite her penchant for making fun of the snooty popular girls uh, whom she and Anne existed on the fringes of, Cordelia had been a relatively snazzy dresser herself, perhaps one of the uh, many things she had inherited from her mother. Now, there are days when even the effort of putting uh, her hair in a high ponytail leaves her utterly exhausted. She used to... I'm concerned. <laughs> yeah, like she sounds like she has depression or like she's beginning to have bipolar and this is like a, a depressive I episode. Write this. Help this writer get through <laughs> her year of college. I know, right? Boyfriend. This this is like one of those things where like first off, like this none of these girls are mean to each other yet. So mm -hmm. it's not it, this is just girls on HBO. There's no mean, there's no mean to be had. Um, no one. Which is not a bad thing necessarily. <laughs> That's just not what I expected. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, she used to love theater, and from the time she played Puck in her fifth grade class's production of A Midsummer Night's Dream, she had fifth been in. Wow. What? Fifth grade. Oh, fifth grade. <laughs> Midsummer Night's Dream. I know, right? Yeah, that's that's pretty advanced. Rich people are, I guess that's what rich people education gets in. Yeah, that's true, yeah. Meanwhile, like at our schools, we had like a, 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 a Christmas carol. A tall tree. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
or like uh I remember we did um in sixth grade at my school there was like a play and I have it was basically every character from every Disney movie visits this kid in his bedroom and that's the play. Mm-hmm. It, it it was a very weird play, and I don't know what they were getting at. I just remember I was one of like I wasn't the kid being visited. I was his friend who came over. <laughs> So I got a lot of talking, but not like I didn't have to be a Disney character, which was fine with me. Didn't uh, you go to a rich kid school? Uh, yeah, I did. Um, before my parents divorced and ran each other out of money, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> she had been a natural at improved comedy. That's how it's spelled. I'm gonna. It's gonna be called that forever. Improved comedy. <laughs> <laughs> it is improved comedy. Yeah. Now, in her acting classes, she sits alone still while classmates uh, work through exercises, desperately trying to avoid eye contact. She used to love swimming, despite her hatred of her family's silver fountain. Now she can hardly stay afloat, and the chlorine stings her eyes and makes her dizzy and nauseated. She can barely eat without feeling sick to her stomach. She still loves books, but hates the way the words blur, and sentences don't make any sense, and her eyelids droop with the effort of staying awake, regardless of how many hours of sleep she had had the night before. She literally sounds like she has, like, clinical depression. Yeah, for real. <laughs> The first semester, when she wasn't in class and or didn't have a migraine, Cordelia spent a ridiculous amount of hours in the library reading Shakespeare and Sylvia Plath and Virginia Woolf and Emily Dickinson. There were other people, she realized, who were born broken, too. Given the fates of Sylvia Plath and Virginia Woolf, however, she wasn't sure she could uh, take comfort in this knowledge or not. On weekends, when the library was closed, days seemed torturously long, even when she awoke at 11.30, watched a... Uh, Peyton Place and I Dream of Jeannie and reruns of Wiley Coyote until almost three in the afternoon and went to bed at eight. Her roommates, Ariel and Stephanie, were aloof, but not that uh but not unpleasant, although Ariel was a bit of a neat freak. They left her alone for the most part, uh never trying to coax her out of her self uh, imposed hermitdom. At first <laughs> Cordelia was glad that her classmates weren't nosy, but now she can't help wishing they li- tried at least a little. The other girls on her floor and in her classes were not unkind either, but their eyes became glassy and their mouths turned slightly downward in confusion whenever she said anything. Watching the easy way they uh, flitted about their days made her chest feel tight and the throat prickle and her throat prickle with tears, uh, frustration, and sadness. That was three paragraphs of just what the fuck was that? <laughs> who has nothing but mean things to say about people except for one comment about her mom's fashion sense. Yeah. Wait, so basically it's mean girls, but it's about yourself. Yeah, it's just mean. Yo, know, I guess maybe she's mean to her. Maybe this is how it starts. This is how it starts, y'all. Regina's grandmother didn't like herself, took it out on her daughter, took it out on like, <laughs> daughter overcompensates, becomes a cool mom. <laughs> Was it on. was it Regina's mom who is the cool mom? Yeah, she, she's uh, she's Amy Poehler. Oh, that's cool. Okay. Mom. Yeah. In a way, Cordelia was almost grateful for the migraines, uh, which she had been getting since middle school, but never with much intensity or frequency, because they gave her a solid, a valid excuse to crawl under her covers and lie perfectly still, staring at the ceiling with a wet towel draped over her forehead, waiting desperately for the Alka-Seltzer aspirin combo to kick in. Damn, if that works for her, she's super lucky. What, because uh, Advil or ibuprofen or whatever it is they give you, or just doesn't? nothing like the only thing that even mildly puts a dent in my migraines is like prescriptions drink like scheduled substances um which is why i take preventative medication (laughs) (laughs) those facts what dropping those facts yeah (laughs) migraine facts migraine facts migraine facts See, n- now I'm just imagining, like, a like a great space coaster or, like, a Sherman and, and Mr. Peabody, but just about migraines. It's like, did you <laughs> yeah. know that the only way to uh, to fix a migraine is with prescription strength med- medication? <laughs> like heroin, Mr. Peabody? No, not like heroin. <laughs> <laughs> also, fun fact, um, you might be able to stop them if, like, it's in the, like, very beginning of your migraine and you get, like the oxygen that people have if they have, you know, COPD or something. If you know someone who's got COPD and you're going to get a migraine, like borrow their oxygen for like a second and breathe it for like five minutes. And it'll sometimes make your migraine not happen, which is great. Yeah. 
Well, see now, but like if they need need the COPD oxygen, <laughs> like give me that for five minutes, and then you, you look over. All right, we got it. Oh, he's dead. Shit. <laughs> oh, man, I have said something sooner. <laughs> yeah. You don't steal it from somebody who needs it that bad. You be like, hey, can I borrow this for a sec? And you take it, and then you breathe it, and then you give it back if they if they need it. Not condoning stealing people's oxygen if they need it. Just put that out there. Please you, don't steal people's oxygen. You go into the nursing home and you're like punching 80 year olds in the face. You're like, give me that shit. Kicking them in the face, kicking them and punching them and stealing their oxygen. Oh. Right away, I, of course. Have you guys ever thought about what it's going to be like when our generation is in uh, nursing homes? I mean, they're just going to have Nintendo Switches. Yeah, unless we get real fast, real quick with hearing aids, it's just, just going to be people going, what? Back and forth <laughs> for most of the time. <laughs> Either that or there's going to be some kind of old person Twitter, and it's just going to be people talking shit to each other <laughs> all day. There's I that. Went, I went home for a hot minute. That's just lunch. Yeah. <laughs> hey, <laughs> Jenkins, <laughs> fuck you. <laughs> I think we'll have good VR at that point in time, so we'll probably have, like, uh, everyone's going to be able to design their own, like, super hot young avatars and be walking around in, like, a VR world. Mm -hmm. I don't want that. So now I'm just thinking the holodeck from Star Trek, but with a bunch of geriatrics. Yes, exactly. (laughs) Um, Oh, hey, oh, wait, it's Anne, sorry. Oh, hey, there's Pauline. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, uh. Oh hey, there's oh god, I don't even remember what voice I was doing for is she is she southern now? I guess she's southern now. Oh hey, there's Pauline. Says Anne, motioning toward their high school classmate. Her mouth opened in a wide smile, her blonde curls bouncing like accordions, and her uh, head thrown back in laughter. Cordelia crin <laughs> what? Oh sorry. <laughs> what was it? I, I I jumped the gun. Oh. Uh Cordelia cringes involuntarily. We should probably go say hi. Anne adds, looking apologetic. Throughout their school career, both Anne and Cordelia secretly hated Pauline, the loudmouthed alpha of their clique. Or rather, the clique that they only sometimes belong to. Oh. Oh, so is this Regina George? So that's their Regina. So she's oh, the... Yeah. She's the... Uh, what's her name? The... the Gretchen the, or Karen or yeah, Kate? Yeah, she she's the she's the Gretchen... And Anne might be the Kate, uh, the Karen, maybe. Yeah. A bit. Who knows? Um, but Anne was always much better of, uh, at hiding her distaste. In retrospect, Pauline had never actually been that bad. But much like uh, the girls at Wellesley, she often uh, talked to Cordelia more slowly than she did to anyone else, uh, and in a much higher pitched voice, as if Cordelia was at least ten years younger or a non sentient animal. Ugh, seriously? Cordelia says, rolling her eyes. I mean, Pauline's great and everything, but I'm pretty sure she thinks I ride the short bus. Anne snickers, and suddenly, uh, Cordelia feels right back at home. It's unfortunate, she thinks, that her comfort zone comes at poor Pauline's expense. She grabs Anne by the arm and leans in. What? Anne asks, smiling brightly, even though Cordelia is sure that they have had this conversation almost as often as she and Nick have discussed uh, how she wished the horses were birds. She does not. Oh no, you've never noticed how she gets all high-pitched, like, Hello, dear Cordelia, how are you? I mean, seriously, why does she do that? I'm not retarded. (laughs) Uh, Apologies for the R word, It, it was the 60s, I guess. Um, yeah, I'm pretty sure it was used in the 60s, but I'm also pretty sure that uh, they nope. didn't. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I was sorry. I jumped the gun to agree with what you said. I was like, you might have said the 60s, but that was all you, 14-year-old or tw- or 19-year-old girl writing this. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> um, Cordelia has to admit, though, that in some ways Pauline's reaction to, their, uh, to her makes sense. If there was ever a definition uh, for m- more... Anne's friend, then Pauline certainly qualifies. Really, Pauline and most of the other girls in the clique put up with Cordelia only because Anne liked her. Sure, Cordelia was pretty, maybe not uh, more so than Pauline, who was Marilyn Monroe level attractive, but certainly better than Anne. But she also knew she came across uh, at least slightly weird. 
the wit she displays uh, displayed around Nick and around Anne never managed to translate when she was in the company of anyone else. In fact, she could barely have a conversation with Pauline without tripping over her words as Pauline regarded her with a look of pity. Oh, come on, says Anne, uh, who was pretty much uh, always the nice one in their friendship. Ridiculously nice sometimes. This is probably why, in spite of her average looks, she had always been more popular with the boys than Cordelia. I think that's just her voice. Cordelia shakes her head. I got it again. <laughs> <laughs> nuh she says. Listen for it. She talks completely normal to everyone else. I guarantee it. She'll be like... She pauses and says in a normal monotone voice, Hi, Anne. How is college? <laughs> <laughs> and then, Hello, Cordelia. How's living at home? Oh, sorry. You go to college, too? Wesley? Wow. That's really great. Good for you. Usually, Anne would be laughing at this, but now she is quiet and subdued. I'm sure she doesn't think that. She says. Cordelia is uh, absolutely right about Pauline's greeting, which is almost word for word what she acted out for Anne, but it doesn't feel uh, like a victory given the way that Anne ruined the moment just seconds earlier. She tunes out and focuses on the rhythmic pounding in her temples as Anne and Pauline chatter on about who knows what. He's funny! Or... Oh, it's... Pauline, I guess. Um, I guess. Yeah. Uh, he's funny. He's funny. Uh, he's funny, Rick. Uh, <laughs> Cordelia hears Pauline mutter and notices that both of the girls are focusing intently on her. Yeah, she says faintly. He's hilarious. She has no idea who he could possibly be, and suddenly wishes she hadn't said anything. Pauline stares at her blankly for what seems to be a whole minute. But can't possibly more be more than a few seconds. I mean, he's funny as in weird, she says, <laughs> predictably returning her tone to baby talk, but also with a faint hint of condensa- condescension. Condi- condescension. Condensation. She's yeah. suddenly wet. Yeah. Huey condescension. Yeah. Condensation condescension. Yeah. Condensation. Sation. Sation. Mm. Oh, Cordelia mumbles. Right, I should go talk to my dad, she adds and hurries away. Off to the side, she hears Pauline scoff. It's so uncomfortable talking to her, she whispers. Uh, Come on, says the always faithful and kind Anne. Anne. Uh, she's actually really cool. I'm just not going to get it again. I know. It's, it, it's lost now. <laughs> well, <Lost>. okay, <laughs> says Paul lately. If you say so, she's your friend after all. On the way over to Rodolfo, Cordelia grabs a wine glass with a clear liquid from a tray, even though she really, really doesn't want it. Her father comes up from his probably fascinating conversation about West Nile virus with the horse's bet when he sees her approach. Cordelia, he says, in a tone that sounds calm and bored, despite his flushed cheeks and tall glass of bright red wine in his hand. He touches the vet lightly on the arm and slowly makes his way over to her. There's someone here I'd like to introduce you to. Great, Cordelia thinks. Another setup. She tries to ignore the, uh, the sting she feels at the back of her throat because her father didn't even bother with a how are you or an it's good to see you. Not that she expected it, really, she tells herself. In spite of everything, Cordelia is con- uh, convinced that her father does legitimately love her. He's just horrible at showing any kind of affection to anyone who lacks fur and hoofs. Um, oh, that just makes him sound like he has relations with his horses. What, so now we're in Equus? Is that what's going on? <laughs> I, it's just what it sounded like. I mean... It's what you wanted to sound like, Chris. <laughs> Be honest. I, I just knew a lot of weird horse people when I was at the horse rehab center that were really into their horses getting better. Yeah. S- see, or, I... Or, or for worse. <laughs> <laughs> My my friend in high school uh, dated somebody who was a horse girl, and uh, she's really into horses. That's I've met cool horse girls. Horse girls are weird, man. And this is a guy, and uh, he he's got that kind of like tight jawed New England accent, right? Um, you want to be Gideon George? God, what is Gideon George? Oh oh, oh oh wait, oh no, that is somebody else. Gideon George is someone else. Um, yes. Yeah. Sure. Be oh, be Gideon want. George. Yeah. Uh, Pleasure to meet you. Is that did we did we do the paragraph that to the very 
important potential client. All oh, right, sorry. To Cordelia's surprise, her father wants to introduce her to not a potential boyfriend, but to a very uh, important potential client, all capitalized. Uh, <laughs> this is Gideon George, he says, and Cordelia fumbles with her drink in order to shake his large, meaty hand. Ew. <laughs> Gideon must be around her father's age. He's silver-haired and stocky with a firm grip. But when she shakes his hand, he looks her directly in the eye and smiles a warm, genuine uh, smile, greenish eyes sparkling in the crystal light of the chandeliers. Cordelia feels blood rush to her face. Perhaps it's just the migraine, she thinks, as Gideon George is far from the type of guy she usually goes for. Oh, God. Is she going to... It's Gideon George, Chris. She's going to... George's grandma. I guess. Oh, oh, no. (laughs) But he's like Older. her dad's age. Yep. Well, I was hoping he'd have a son come out at the last minute, but it doesn't seem like that's what's gonna happen. No, nope. nope. that's nope. Yep. Well, all right. I don't know how to make this guy's voice. He's a creeper. Literally, I was doing Morty's voice for Pauline. Just do whatever you want. It's fine. As long as we can tell like the difference between characters, we can make them whatever we want. Just go for Pleasure it. Pleasure to meet you. Says <laughs> Diddy and George. <laughs> Your father mentioned you go to Wellesley. Cordelia can only nod as she is starting to feel all kinds of feverish. Oh, this is so no. I just uh, <laughs> <laughs> Suddenly, the woman... Beso- How- what? How much more do we have to do? I don't want to get into some, some like 50-year-old man being with a 20-year-old girl. I mean... <laughs> Yeah, pretty much. Uh, suddenly, the the woman beside, uh, beside Gideon, whom Cordelia hadn't even noticed, springs to life and steps forward. I am Patience, she says, which Cordelia has never heard before as a name for a human being. For real, dude. Uh, she's small and slight with straight, thin, ebony hair, and she looks like she can't be much older than Cordelia. Gideon's fiancé, she adds. As Patience leans in, Cordelia is assaulted by a scent of pear mixed with vanilla mixed with laundry detergent smelling perfume that is so vile she almost gags. Quickly, she shoves her nose and mouth into her wine glass and takes a huge swallow of the bitter acidic liquid that smells like shoe polish. She chokes and then starts coughing. Are you okay? Gideon George asks. The obvious predator who's clearly dating women that are 20 years his... Junior? 30, 30 years his junior his junior yeah. um that that wasn't water cordelia points out brilliantly rodolfo rolls his eyes the human being named patient steps forward and gently touches a perfectly manicured finger to one of cordelia's earrings cordelia is so surprised she completely misses the words coming out of patient's mouth um what she asks patient rolls her eyes and uh, repeats herself but to cordelia it looks like her words or her lips are moving wordlessly cordelia shakes her head quickly as static fills her ears sorry what she says again patience uh who clearly doesn't live up to her name at all there's a kitty yeah, Danny, there's a kitty kitty he's so cute oh i love a little white spot on his nose he's got a white nose and a white chest and white boots and white little ankle socks I love it. And, and then for the people listening to this, fucking, I can't see the cat. Keep... It's a, it's an orange cat, and uh. it's adorable. It's medium-length fur, and um, it's mostly orange with some white on it. Um Siberian forest cat. Oh, look at him. He's so happy. Oh, this is so cute. <laughs> um, let's see. Stag Watch the video version, y'all. See the cat. Yeah, see the cat. Um, he got those like really pretty like golden eyes. I love that. Let's see. Uh, Patience, who clearly doesn't live up to her name at all, sighs. Uh, I said. I, I said. She starts, but again her words come out garbled. Cordelia knows very well that there is nothing more awkward than asking someone to repeat themselves three times in a row, so she figured she should just answer. Despite her migraine making her head feel fuzzy, she is able to conclude that Patience probably said something about her earrings. (laughs) Now, the question is what exactly did she say about them? I like your earrings. Where did you get your earrings? I have a pair of earrings just like those. May I borrow your earrings? Unfortunately, all of those require slightly different responses. Naturally, Cordelia gives a single word answer that doesn't match any of the scenarios. Yeah, she says. 
<laughs> Super relatable. Patience gives her the exact same smile as uh, she is so used to seeing from Pauline and the girls at Wellesley. And I feel sorry for you because you're clearly special smile. Um, let's see. So we say special now. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I know, right? Cordelia, may I talk to you alone for a second? Rodolfo says, his mouth close to her ear and her, his voice tense and quiet. Uh, yeah, sure, Cordelia says, because what else is there to say? She follows Rodolfo into the hall. Are you drunk? Her father asks, uh, once they are a safe dif- distance away from everybody else. What? No! Cordelia says a bit too quickly, but in the back of her mind she wonders, am I? She did swallow nearly an entire glass of vodka, or tequila, or gin. Cordelia is no expert on alcohol, but as, uh, she, but as she has uh, seen Rodolfo take his daily nightcap or rum mixed with whiskey, she is able to differentiate clear spirits from darker ones. She clears her throat. I mean, no, I'm fine, fine. Why? Uh, of course, she knows why. Clearly, her behavior around Gideon and Patience went somehow beyond typical Cordelia awkwardness. She knows she should feel ashamed, but she's too tired, dizzy, and nauseated to feel anything other than the desire to crawl into her childhood bed, pull the covers over her head, and hibernate until next fall, which, she can't help thinking in a small corner of her mind, would make her the exact opposite of bears, raccoons, skunks, or any other animals that hibernate during the winter. Um, I think that is probably a good place to stop because we've been at this for an hour and a half. Um, I also skimmed forward. Uh, yeah, it is between Gideon and uh, and her, which is super for... awkward. Yeah. He, so he wouldn't, wouldn't be as awkward if she were 30 and he was 60, but it's not that. She's 20 and he's 50 or whatever. 30, at least, though, like, you're, like, a no, full adult. No, it's not as bad, but it's yeah. still awkward. <laughs> well, the, the, the typical, the, the general rule of thumb is half your age plus seven, right? So. I would say it's whatever, if you're in the same life stage, then you, sh- you should be okay. And if you're in the same percentage of life lived, kind of, like, 21 to 27, no so good. 31 to 26, probably fine. Interesting. I didn't really think of it that way. Um, all I know is that, like, to my my general rule of thumb for what a millennial is is if you were in school during nine eleven. That's that's a millennial. Yeah. Anyway, Cat, what'd you think of uh, what you heard? I mean, I wasn't quite sure why she bothered structuring it with Mean Girls since she basically just started to write her own story. But if that's what you need to do to get confidence to write your own story, great. Not that I'm dissing fan fiction for the sake of itself, but that did not seem to be what this story was. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I think she wasn't as I, I think she wasn't as bad of a writer as I've heard. Definitely. Um. So, no, it was okay, especially for like a first draft, which it obviously was. Mm-hmm. I mean. It- had some feelings that she needed to work out, you know. I, I yeah. do. I do like the idea <laughs> of had to read this out loud. <laughs> I do like the idea of like a mean <laughs> girl. Imagine if they found out. Have we had a writer figure out that they were featured yet? Uh, no, no, nobody's uh come forward. <laughs> there, there have been a couple who are like, "Here, read mine," on uh, air. Um, but I feel weird doing that, like outright also it mostly just comes down to what the guest wants so that's just hasn't lined up with what's what someone has sent us yet oh, that's mm-hmm. fun yeah. oh, I, I like that person they sent you one that's so cute yeah um i i do think it would be cool to have like a mean girls like prequel where it takes place in like different because you know high school was different in different decades so like if you have a 60s mean girls a 20s mean girls like a <laughs> It's definitely you get different kinds of mean girls, I think, because like, uh, well, I, I know you definitely get. Uh, let's see, my friend Jeremy said this about when I was, when I said, Flash isn't what I wanted him to be in like the newest iteration of of Spider Man, and he kind of like swayed me to being like, this is what jocks are now. Oh, oh, the uh. thing where he's like kind of a power geek, and he's like, yeah. yeah where he's like he's a jerk and i was like ah this is because he went to west ranch the rich person school this is the jock that you were used to mm. um, 
But it makes sense. Like, I'm sure that kind of jock exists and was relatable to him and is probably relatable to a lot of people who didn't go to my school that was kind of like more generic, but I'm sure isn't as generic nowadays. I think it's probably shifted to having more of like the power geek jock type as opposed to like the jock jock type. Um, then again, I haven't been in high school for a long time, so please correct me if you are a high school student and this is not your experience and I'm just totally wrong. The Flappers Bean Girls, I would watch that. Oh, oh, well, I mean, there's uh, there's Splendor in the Grass with Natalie Wood, but that's oh not God. Mean TikTok Girls. Is this girl who pretends to be a toxic mean girl, but from like 1903. Oh my God, yeah. It's like a mean girl with an Anna Green Gables. It's great. Yeah. <laughs> I'll send you the name of it so you can put like a link to one in the tick in the show notes. I, I, oh I God, will like I will gladly do that, or I'll tweet it out. Um, but uh, cat, where where can people find you out there? You and your cat. You can find me uh, on at this is cat Moore. So this is and then cat K A T M O O R E. 